Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Lauren, the film student extraordinaire. If you're new, or if you're not new, same intro every, either way. And today is part two of my Photoshop Neural Filters series. We are going to be talking about the impact on images and maybe society as a whole with these neural filters and the evolution of photo image manipulation. I was kissing you with my eyes open. So now that that's out of the way, if you're suddenly being like um, part two, then be sure to click uh, the link in my description down below to watch the first part of this series. It'll probably make a lot more sense as I go about it because that where I'm actually kind of demonstrating what you can do with these filters versus in this one, I may include some images. I'm not sure yet, it depends, but I'm definitely just gonna be really talking about them. So I put my notes on my <laughs> computer. So if I look down, that's why. I really wanted to try to find some actual, sorry, I'm just like moving things to adjust. I wanted to find some actual, um, like really good resources and websites to kind of come up with these ideas and back up what I'm saying. So I will also be including those sources down below, but that's why I do want to make sure I'm not misrepresenting any information. So first we're just going to quickly go over what exactly Adobe Photoshop is doing to create neural filters and how they work. So basically they're using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we're gonna go into a little bit more what that means because for the common person like myself, um, I don't really understand machine, like machine learning. I think everyone sort of has a vague idea of AI, artificial intelligence, but not huge. I may ask my sister to pop in. Hey, Nicole. 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 Whoa. Can you give a quick little explanation of what machine learning is? My sister is a math and computer science major. And I think she'll be able to explain what machine learning is better than I can. Yeah. So there's basically, well, there's many different kinds. Um, Do you know what a GAN so, is? A what? A GAN, a generative adversarial network. Actually, I think so. Okay, so you'll probably have to do a lot of cutting. That's I'm fine, just gonna that's talk. fine, that's fine. So basic programs like make decisions by condition. So like if this happens, they do this, else something else happens. But if you want to get more uh, fancy, you can just throw a bunch of training data, have it try a bunch of things until it comes up with something that works, and then use test data to then see how well it actually works on other data, not just like a specific set that you gave it. So that's one kind of machine learning. Wait, that actually makes a lot of sense based on the article I was reading. Yeah, so the, the fact that for like, that if you give it pictures of faces and then it determines, you know, they make some, or like there's one, a common thing where like you give a, a machine a bunch of pictures of cats and dogs and it basically then just like figures out of those, what is similar that a dog has, what is similar that a cat has, and then you give it a picture that doesn't recognize, and it sees which ones it matches more. And if it matches more from its cat side, then it says it's a cat, oh. or it's its dog. So that's one kind. Then there's another kind, which, and I think this is more of the generated stuff. Actually, I don't know that might be that, or there's another one where you. Oh, I guess I should look at the camera. I really don't care. That's fine. Um, where you just start with the base inputs and outputs and then it just keeps on changing things and it takes the best one and then it makes iterations off of that. So these are um, uh, genetic algorithms and then it just keeps, you just keep on going out and theoretically each generation is improving because it's like survival of the fittest, the best performing one advances. And again, you're doing that on testing data. So then you are training data. So then you can change it to be on testing data on new data. So that's some of the wow. machine learning Wow, options. she's so cool. Wait, this is actually really helpful because part of what it does is like you send your image up and it goes and compares it to data in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's looking at your, like maybe your testing image to see what it looks like. Yeah, so especially because like faces are one of the most like widely used. Um, like one of my classes at school, we like had to come up with a way of identifying like you, like you were given a face and then like with an algorithm it identifies what should like what people look similar to that 
So maybe what it needed to do when you give some faces is that it might be breaking like everyone into subsets of people and might not be comparing all humans. It might be okay. if you give some, then maybe it's like, okay, you look like, you know, teenager white girl. <laughs> maybe that's your, maybe that's your category. Maybe not. Um, oh, wow. So, and then, yeah, so I think part of it might be that because it's still using other images. It's not only using your faces to like come up with them more. Oh. That's, um, I don't know. Oh, by the way, do not work on this. Everything I could say could be complete lie. <laughs> and if you're in the comments section and you're like judging me, be chill. Don't judge her. She's brilliant and this is off. Hero. This is off the cup. Yeah. She just pulled me in and was like, answer some questions. Yeah, I was just conveniently filming and she just got home. Yeah. So, yes, I have summoned her. Now I'm petting the dog. Yeah. It's a much more worthy uh, pursuit. I thought that was really interesting. Because I wrote this artificial machine learning, but I don't really understand machine learning. But now I feel like I have a bitter, a bitter, a better understanding. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking an AI class next semester, so then I'll be able to answer more questions on the difference between maybe AI we'll do a part and three, machine maybe. learning. <laughs> a part three to the series. Are you making a part two? This is the part two. Oh, this is the part two. I guess that makes sense. <laughs> Anywho, so I want to be all the way. <laughs> Come on, gal. <laughs> Is he in frame? Oh, there he is! There he is! He's a star. A star is born. Who put the gladiator? Gladiator Hercules! Is he bold? Our favorite flavor! <laughs> Alright, what was that, Dad? Tell me what Alrighty. Alrighty. After that thrilling interlude, okay, so back to Photoshop. So, as I okay. we just talked about, Nicole gave a really great little portion about machine learning. So although Photoshop uses artificial intelligence machine learning for a bunch of different things, and they released a, a lot of various features in this new update, the biggest one are the neural filters. And that's what I want to talk about. And that's what I talked about in the last video. However, they did also uh, add in a sky replacement feature. Um, you can now colorize old photos. So it's not just the neural filters, but that's like the big thing that I think is pretty whack that Photoshop is doing. So neural filters can literally let you adjust age, expression, lighting, um, like movement, direction, even gaze. So like right now I'm looking at the camera, but I could change the gaze to look to the side. That's pretty crazy in my humble opinion. So they do that by increasing or decreasing certain factors. So like for the example of happiness one that we looked at last week, like if I was trying to make a neutral face, if I want to increase happiness, then basically they would like bring the cheeks up and out a little teeth. If they want to decrease happiness, it goes like the other way. So I go from to frowny, basically. <laughs> Guess he didn't like my frown. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh yeah, and you can also transfer makeup from one face to another. So that's kind of interesting. Like maybe you are, I think that's probably the coolest for if you're maybe trying to come up with some inspirational pictures and you like a certain makeup look, you can see do these colors, like does this work on this other person? I think that could be really interesting. Otherwise, it just sort of seems like if you were at a photo shoot, presumably you'd have like a bunch of different makeup looks the day of but you never really know what people and what they're looking for. Um, and then you can also like remove glasses and do basic skin smoothening. Now you can do that in Photoshop using like the healing brush or patch tool already, but this is just like a way to do it faster that you may still want to do your own retouching additionally as well, which I'm going to get into later in this video also. So this I thought was really interesting and I'm not really sure if I agree with this statement or not. But the vice president of digital imaging of, of Adobe said, Photoshop is the world's most advanced IA application. And I don't know about that, but I do agree with the second part of the statement. We're creating things in images that weren't there before, because I think, I mean, obviously now people are more aware of Photoshop and some images are obviously Photoshop. Like if someone's dancing with a fire, like an open fire pit on the moon, like, okay, that's obviously Photoshopped, but I think a lot of times people still do assume an image they're seeing if it doesn't have anything obviously added that it's real. It is powerful to plop in something 
and uh, especially when it comes to like a digital image because you kind of think of that as a snapshot of reality and obviously there's coloring and I like, tend to do a lot of color edits for my own pictures. Um, so I'll try to put an example of like a before and after of what I like to do with my coloring, but I don't really like change how I actually physically like my body shape or anything like that. Or like, I don't generally plop out a tree. I did semi recently crop out um, something like in a picture of my Instagram with wings. There was something in the corner that I didn't like. And I did take that out with the patch tool. To do all of these things, and as we hit on a little bit earlier, Adobe uses the power of generative adv adversarial networks or GANs, maybe it's GANs. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. And that's a type of machine learning that is particularly good at generating visual imagery. So that makes sense because Photoshop's all about images. So with these GANs, there is processing that, processing that is done locally on the computer and processing that's done in the cloud. So if you remember, and I'll put a little insert here, from the last video when we were waiting for the results, you saw that there was that little loading symbol and it says like looking through data in the cloud. So it is looking to compare images from Adobe. Oh, excuse me. It is looking at images in Adobe's huge base as well as doing some basic functioning just through your own system. And it learns from past examples. So if someone's done a retouching job to remove spots, they look to see what that person removed on their example and what would they do in this one if it was like the smoothening skin feature. And they try to copy from selected examples, as I just said. Um, yeah, so they copy from selected examples and Adobe actually went through and collected a thousands of before and after images to work with here, as well as their own professional like Adobe stock images. So they obviously have a lot to work with and they really went through and looked at what professionals do because they're not trying to look like, like if I were to do a bunch of retouching, the level of retouching that I can do in my current level of Photoshop is nowhere near what a professional retoucher would be doing. This is really interesting though, because if you only are really working through a certain selected imagery and data, which you have to um, at this point, because it's not like you, any program has necessarily has access to everything unless there's been some hacking been involved. So you can lead to biases from biased data, which is why often you realize that like facial recognition software works best on white men and suffers when it comes to women and also people of color. I had an example happen of this when I was in the city um, many moons ago now. I think it was January. Um, my friend and I were doing, we were at the Cooper Hewitt and there was like a design interactive thing and you kind of sit down and it tells, it kind of, then it reads your face and gives you what demographics it thinks you're in. And um, me as a white woman, I actually did read pretty well, but my friend who is uh, Asian, she, uh, they got like a lot of things about her wrong. Adobe claims they have an ethics team involved in this process to make sure that they are getting a variety of people, demographics, so that they won't have these issues and racial biases. Yeah, so the ethic committee is working to preserve skin color and other issues like that because when they're comparing things, we don't want an issue of colorism where they're kind of editing somebody to make them look lighter than they really are. That is not what Adobe wants to happen with their neural filters and hopefully that is not what's happening. To note, these AI edits are not flawless. As you saw with I did one um, when I did one last week, there was the edit, especially the makeup transfer, where there was some of the lipstick didn't really transfer properly and I would have had to do my own retouching, which I really wasn't really trying that hard and it looked really bad. But like real people who are real professional retouchers, they would do that and they would, you know, do it really quick. But if you're just doing like basic things, it's still really easy to make a major change, like adding more hair or changing the light direction of the gaze. Like now if someone's not looking at the camera, that may never be, have to be an issue ever again because you can just fix their gaze, which is really, really interesting. And it's just like kind of rechanging the moment that actually like existed, which I just think is, I think it's really cool, potentially scary though. So we're gonna get into that later. And then the last thing I wanted to mention before we move on is that these neural filters from Photoshop are not the first kinds of filters to do this sort of thing. There's also Style Gone 2, 
Art Breeder Deoldify and Runway ML Suite. I personally have not really used any of those other ones, but one of the articles I was looking at was comparing different ones, and it seems like Art Breeder seems to have a lot, a lot of options, um, but it doesn't, the, what, the picture that I saw in the article that I was looking at, it doesn't maybe look as nice, um, but it seems to accomplish a lot more. So there are a lot of other options, but if you want a software program that you don't want to like relearn how to do anything with, um, that's more already what you're working with, then obviously Photoshop, if you're using it already, that makes sense for you to keep using. But if you're looking for some other options or some that are free, because I believe some of them are free to use, then these are options for you if you want to mess around with this stuff. And then just to reiterate, so the neural filters that are currently officially out are the skin smoothening and the style transfer. The ones that are in beta mode, which you can access, but like they're obviously putting them in as a beta, so they're saying they're not perfect yet, are the smart portrait, which is all the ones with the changing expression, age, lighting, direction, makeup transfer, depth awareness haze, colorize, super zoom, and JPEG artifacts removal. And then future ones that are not eligible to come yet, photo restoration, dust and scratches, noise reduction, face cleanup, photo to sketch, sketch to portrait, pencil artwork, and face to caricature. I really want the face to caricature one to come because I tried, like I've tried making caricatures in Photoshop using like, um, like layering tools and stuff like that. And they sort of work, but like they don't look as good. And I would rather just be able to press a button and like just kind of tweak that way versus like spending hours and hours making stuff that like then doesn't even look good, which I have done. Now that we've talked about like the behind the scenes and how these things work, let's talk about what this could actually mean for everybody. So we already know that like my generation and the generations around ours, but not solely those because technology does not just belong to the young people, has really impacted body image, self-esteem issues because of social media and applications like Photoshop, especially I think the one everyone knows is Facetune and certain influencers such as like Tanim Mojo and James Charles are known for using Facetune to different extents and for different purposes. And Facetune, people say, is like it's really easy to, you know, brighten your eyes, um, remove a pimple, but it's also really easy to slim in your waist, change your arm. You can literally change all these little things in Facetune right on your phone. So you don't need to be a Photoshop whiz to do that. And that has caused a lot of problems. I know like I follow some Instagram accounts that are like reality versus Instagram or something that are beauty false because Sometimes I think there's just a lot of, wow, like all these people look so perfect and why don't I look like that? So to be able to see like, okay, I mean, obviously people work their angles, that is not anything new, but to know that like not only they're working their angles, but they're also literally changing how they look. And I don't judge you for doing that or not. Like if that makes you happy, you're not necessarily like physically hurting someone, but I think it should be more openly talked about so people realize someone is like got work done or did do some photoshopping or face tuning because when people act like you just have to work out or eat this one thing and then you'll look like me but like you don't even look like you in your picture so that can be where i think the problems really come from so you know it's it's nice that people can look the way that they want to look and the way that makes them feel confident but if you start realizing that the only way you feel confident about posting a picture is if you've edited it a lot then how are you supposed to like, I just don't understand how you could feel comfortable looking at yourself like in the mirror or just like on the daily, knowing that you don't look the way that you portray yourself to be. And if you got all these comments from people saying how beautiful you look or how good you look and you don't actually look like that, I just think that could be really sad. I do like get the fact that a lot of people are in a much more public spot like, like than I am. Like if I'm just walking out about, no one's gonna be like trying to sneak like paparazzi pictures of me and going like, oh my God, like did she gain weight or whatever? Like the worst is where like, is she pregnant? Like no one's asking that about me cause I am not a celebrity, I'm not really well known. So there is like an image to maintain. I do understand that they have an image to maintain, but it just is really bad for the young people. So I was like, one of the studies that I was looking at was saying that this extreme increase in photo manipulation since the mid 2010s has led to more eating disorders and other maladaptive behaviors in young people, especially young women. And as someone who's had um, like body image issues and disorder eating tendencies, like that really resonated with me. 
so it's just really sad because i know how much that has really like impacted my life and i know it's impacted so many other people to even more extremes and it's just really bad to be constantly exposing ourselves to these unrealistic people and when you're on instagram like you're not comparing yourself like maybe you're thinking i'm not comparing myself but our brains work really fast because we immediately have to judge a situation and that's because when we were you know way back when we had to decide is this a situation that's dangerous like is something about to come and attack me for our survival and though you know we don't need to be worried about running away from lions anymore most of us we still have that quick judging that happens in our brains so like we're just like scrolling on our phones like la di da and then you're like oh my god i don't look like that or you know who else has had that experience where you're using like a cute filter on instagram or snapchat and maybe you're using it because you like like the little fake dog ears or whatever but then when that filter goes away suddenly you're like oh my god i'm so much less cute and that's like that's not that's not a good thing i mean there are people who've literally gotten surgeries to look like their filtered selves which is really sad in my opinion um if you want to get that to look certain way i think that's cool i'm totally for if you want to get plastic surgery but to specifically look like your filtered fake self, that part is what makes me sad. Social media just thinks that there's something wrong with us because we're looking at all these beautiful people. And I have like do work on like unfollowing people who just make me feel bad about my like myself and my body because social media is supposed to be a way to connect with others and like have fun with that, I think. Not a way to feel bad about ourselves, but there is just a lot of toxicity up there. And if people are getting increasingly looking amazing all the time with all these retouching and applications like Photoshop and Facetune, then like, there's gonna be people where you're not really gonna know who, like you're not gonna know if someone's using these tools or not necessarily. And you might just feel like you're doing it wrong. And you know, I think there might be some wrong ways to live your life potentially, but I think for the most part, there are plenty of ways to do it. And you don't need to look like a certain Instagram model or a celebrity to be having a good life and to be healthy. There are just some really unrealistic expectations. Like a lot of times you see like a woman with like a large chest and incredibly tiny waist and then like a huge rear end. Um, <laughs> and it's like, maybe you look like that, but some of those proportions just seem a bit off and it's like, where are all your organs? So we know that, but we you can know that and then still feel bad about yourself at the same time. Along that lens, as I was talking about a couple minutes ago, more people are opting for elective surgeries than ever before. And as I said, like, that's totally cool if that's what you want to do. But it's sad to me that if it's just because you're always trying to look like the next trend or the next best thing, when like you are the best thing already for you. And that just makes me sad if people feel like they need to look a certain way, they need to look like this person. But the thing is that person doesn't even look like that person. So it's just really, like that just makes me a little sad and concerned about the future. I mean, photo manipulation has gone so far just in the past 10 years, I feel like. So it's a little scary to think what could be happening in the next five to 10 years. And that's the thing, technology is just always is picking up its own pace. It's not gonna slow down. And these are these tools are not gonna go away. They're only gonna increase in scale and in accessibility so it's just something that we need to be aware of and understand that these things are happening and we are thinking about them whether or not we want to so i know that after this all speech like i'm still gonna want to play around with these neural filters i think they're fun and as someone who enjoys images and visual media like that's something that i know i'm still gonna be using but i just want to make sure that i'm at least trying to think about it and use them responsibly I mean, it's one thing where I'm making like an artistic collage, maybe you want to go out there. But if I'm trying to put a picture of myself, I don't want to find myself overly editing it because I want to make sure that when I wake up, I'm happy with who I am, just like I hope you are all happy with who you guys are. So that wraps up this video. Um, please let me know down in the comments if you're interested in um, maybe me working with Nicole a bit more to come up with more um, like more strict like research information about machine learning and artificial intelligence if that's something you're interested in if you like this video please remember to give it a thumbs up and of course don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any one of my posts and you support me and the channel and that's all for now have a great day and stay safe bye